Hi, welcome to this week's episode of Real Talk, Come Follow Me. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 133 to 134, prepare ye, prepare ye, I added the second one, <laughs> for the coming of the bridegroom. Are you the announcer for I the guess, town? I guess, yeah. You're the town announcer? Yeah. Yes. I like it. I like it. <laughs> so these two sections are, are fascinating, and 133 is an interesting section just because it's it's not it's not what most of the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants are in order of time. But once we get to these last few, they're kind of they can be a little bit out of order. So section 133 was actually given um, back all the way back um, when they were trying to uh, when they received the revelation that they should put Joseph's revelations together in what they would call the Book of Commandments. And so it was all the way back in like the mid 60s in the Doctrine and Covenants. Not in, anyway, not in the timeline. <laughs> so in the mid 60s. And, and so is there authorized to put Joseph's revelation in a book so that they can be preserved and also passed out um, and taken on missions and stuff like that. They, the Lord reveals to them section one to be an introduction and section, we, we call it 133. Now it wasn't called that call. It wasn't 133 back then but 133 to be a conclusion. So he kind of gives like the appendix. Yeah, the first like the first chapter and the last chapter of the last days. Yeah, the book ends. The book ends. And so it's actually a really cool section to read and if you if you're one of those uh, nerdy scripture people, <laughs> get section 1 and section 133 and, read them. and start putting them together and you'll see some beautiful patterns. Yeah, and section numbers were not from the beginning assigned, so I think sometimes yeah. we get tripped up by order. Mm -hmm. And even the Book of Mormon is not chronologically presented exactly. either. Yeah. yeah, get used to it because the Old <laughs> Testament's a coming. Get used to that. That was our warning. That yeah. was our public service We're trying to like slowly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, last week when we were talking temples and the week before, I almost said a whole bunch of Old Testament stuff. I know. But I held back. I held back. Um, verse 22 of section 133 is uh, an important uh, reference to the second coming. The Lord and the Savior shall stand in the midst of his people. And Elder Anderson talked about this in April 2015 when he said, He will not come wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, but he will appear in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory with all the holy angels. We will hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The sun and the moon will be transformed and the stars will be hurled from their places. You and I, or those who follow us, the saints from every quarter of the earth, shall be quickened and caught up to meet him. And those who have died in righteousness, they too will be caught up to meet him in the midst of heaven. Then a seemingly impossible experience, all flesh, the Lord says, shall see me together, and we will kneel in reverence, and the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it, and it shall be as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. I would love to invite our, our listeners to go back and review that talk, because I remember when Elder Anderson gave mm -hmm. it, all of a sudden he is quoting only mainly scripture. Yeah. All of that that I read, they weren't original. They're not his original words, no, really. No, he took a, an amazing mosaic of all of these descriptors and all of these scripture references to help us in one spot, a one-stop shop, right? Mm -hmm. Of what it will be like when the Savior will come again. And I guess I just want to pose the question that we've talked a little bit about here before is with the second coming of the Savior, I think it's important to note that leading up, that pattern, I'm currently reading in the Book of Mormon where Samuel the Lamanite yes. is being shot at. You mean, with you mean Sammy Sam the Rockstar? Sam the Man, yeah, from no, last. Sammy the Rockstar. Yeah. You Whatever. shot me in the leg during that episode. Do you remember? <laughs> that was a revisit to season one. That if was you want to go back and see that episode? <laughs> it was not. It was <laughs> done out kidding. of love and yeah. teaching. Yeah. That was Thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but I think when I read those sections in the Book of Mormon and you see how the believers mm -hmm. are going to be put to death because they are holding fast to the to the signs of the times and their faith, I I feel like that is the pattern for what we will feel as we prepare. So when Elder Anderson taught that, it was like. Others are going to gather, you know, there's going to be all this opposition, but we're going to have one voice mm -hmm. and it's not, it's every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that the Savior is here. And I just wonder, how will you feel? How do you think you're going to feel? I think, uh, I like how it says in there, he talks about the voice of uh, many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. Those to me, those are things to me that are overwhelming and so um, when you experience them, especially when you're in it, 
um, it's overwhelming. And I think that's what I, I think that's going to be a big part of it. We always laugh. Are, are you going to like run around all excited? Are you going to cry? Like, what's it going to be like? I can't wait to kneel down and confess the name of the Lord. And I just think um, it's probably going to be a lot of both. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I just, I can't, I can't wait for it. Mm-hmm. I can't I'm ready wait for, for tomorrow. Because what go? it'll mean, right? Because yeah. now, now what this earth's trajectory will be totally changed yeah. forever. Right. Which is so great. Amazing. And so Elder Anderson, he talked in there about in clouds of heaven clothed with power and great glory. So this might not be surprising to you, but the second coming of Jesus <laughs> Has will, a clothing yeah, it will include a fashion statement. Yeah. Jesus has already picked out his outfit for the second coming. And we know it because he tells, a, tells us what he's going to wear in uh, section 133. And so uh, what I want to do with this is, so in section 133, it's really verses 46 to 53. I'm going to jump around in there. Um, but I, I want to talk real quick about, I want to stop for a second and talk about how God uses clothing in scripture. And this will be just an illustration to kind of give you a sense so that you can then dive in deeper and look at other symbolic clothing um, references. And like I said, these are things that are so vital to know when it comes to going to the temple because clothing is a major part of our temple endowment and ceilings and so on, and all of it points to Christ. So let me give you three examples from the scriptures. And I'm just going to kind of summarize them. Each one is a whole lesson by itself. So let's start at the beginning of the earth, right? We're at the end of the earth. Well, let's go back to the beginning. So after Adam and Eve are cast out, we know that they are in this very vulnerable state. They call it nakedness, right? They're scared. They don't know what to do. They've been hiding from God because they're not sure if they messed everything up. They knew they weren't supposed to take the fruit, but they felt like they should. And so they're really in this like transition phase. And, transition uh, from transgression. Right? I like that. <laughs> it was Do you write little, books? Uh, I don't know. It's a little alliteration <laughs> for like extra. That. <laughs> and so anyway, so how does God reassure him? Well, first he testifies, I, I, I'm going to provide a savior for you. And you can just imagine in their minds like, yes, because we need to be saved. And we've been feeling like we, you know, what's going to happen. And then he says, let me give you a, let me give you some clothes so that every morning you remember this. And he makes them coats of skins in Genesis 3.21 and said, and talks about how it's in similitude of the sacrifice of Christ. Well, the sacrifice of Jesus testifies of our worth. So every morning when they put on their garments, what do they think? I am worth saving. And there is a savior who is capable of saving me. So that's the first one. The second one is right in the middle of the, or right in the meridian of time when Jesus is on earth, uh, just after or during the Last Supper near the end. John 13 talks about, um, let's see, the supper was ended in verse 2. So verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Verse 4, so he rises up, and this is almost one of those like, It's so fast you don't even realize what's Mm -hmm. happening. He rises up from supper and laid aside his garments. So now he's disrobing and it took a towel and girded himself. So basically he's just, he's just covered just kind of his, um, it's almost like a loincloth to some extent, but a little bit more. The apostles, that would have been unmistakable to them. That is, that is kind of the general uh, clothing worn by slaves or servants at the time. So Jesus intentionally dresses himself as a slave, kneels down and begins washing their feet. And then, and so you think of Peter at first, he's like, what are you doing? I should wash yours. And Jesus is like, no, pay attention. I'm doing this as on purpose. And so he takes Peter's feet and he starts washing him. And think about Peter sitting there watching the savior dressed as a slave, taking the dirt from Peter and taking it upon himself as he, as he wipes that dirt with the, with the um, towel that he's girded with. And, and you start thinking about that relationship connection of Christ as a servant of eternity and what that means. So that's the next one. And then the third one, I'm taking too long to get here. No, but that's good. But I just want to show you why clothing is so important to me. Because verses 48 and 50, Yeah, right? so now when you get into, so verse 48, um, what's the Lord going to wear? The Lord shall be red in his apparel and his garments like like him that treadeth in the wine vat. Mm-hmm. This is a testimony of Gethsemane. So the Lord is trying to tell us something without even saying a word. He shows up in red and then he goes on and talks about what he's what what the object lesson is. Let me just go to 
you can read it in the next few verses, but let me skip to verse 52 and 53. And this is definitely what he wants to say with, these clo- with this clothing choice. And that is, he wants to testify of his loving kindness. He would not have done it if he didn't love us. He wants to testify of his goodness, that he was afflicted, meaning he gets me, he knows what it's like to be me, um, that he redeemed us because he loves us, and that he bore us or carried us or is carrying us. And so when you think about clothing in the scriptures and clothing in the temple, all of it points to some aspect of the redeeming um, attributes of Jesus Christ and that we are redeemable and that he, he sees us, all of us is worth saving. <gasps> I did it. I'm, I don't care if that's all we talk about. Whew, wasn't we, that fun? If we end early, which we've never done. so I'm not <laughs> We gonna, have never done that. No, of I course. think it's time well spent. We're not going to start today. No, I appreciate the reminder. And I had some sacred teachings that I don't feel that I should share on camera. But just I'd invite our listeners to also listen to what has already been shared with a spirit of being taught at a higher level mm-hmm. about whether you're in doubt or you're not. Yeah, well... And, Everything. And seeing Christ in everything. Yeah, like next time you go to the temple, if you're endowed, though all three of those symbols mm-hmm. are obvious in the mm-hmm. temple. Yeah, I love that. Section 134. I haven't said I love that for a while, I so it. I had to throw it in. <laughs> First season, I said it way too much, and I've tried to <laughs> dial it I know, up I've been worried love. that you don't no, love No, I love anything. everything you say. Yeah. I'm just trying not to be I've been insecure lately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to talk freedom of religion. Okay. C- complete shift. I have no yeah. bridge for that. Well, so here we that's go. what happens. But one of my most favorite Joseph Smith quotes, I mean, hands down, mm-hmm. I'm so glad that this is the week we get to say it. So I'm going to share it in, in entirety. I am just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination for the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the Latter-day Saints, would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics, or of any other denomination who may be unpopular and too weak to defend themselves. That's in the history of the church. And I just, Willard Richards reports on this. I feel like verse four specifically talks about that we believe that religion is instituted of God and that men are amenable to him and to him only for the exercise of it unless their religious opinions prompt them to infringe upon the rights and liberties of others. Which is important, by the way. So important. It's important. I mean, this this doctrine, to me, is one of the most expansive. Mm-hmm. And it allows for the door to stay open for building Zion. In, in the most recent conference, uh, President Oaks specifically invites everyone to go back to their church, mm-hmm. not just come to our church. Yeah. And I grew up in a very um, diverse interfaith uh, community where I was the token member of this faith. Mm-hmm. And because of that, my high school friends celebrate my faith, but I celebrate their faith. Yeah. I attended Catholic churches with my friends. I attended community churches and Baptist churches. And one of my good friends was Buddhist. And mm-hmm. I feel like I am better because of that. And because of that, a lot of my high school friends send me random, we've talked about it here on Real Talk before, pictures of the Feather River Temple that's being built. This LDS temple that was was originally the land was owned by a Sikh family mm-hmm. of a totally different faith. But they're so happy that now another religious structure is being built there. And I think there is there is so much of Joseph Smith's fruits that we could celebrate. This is one that I have been grateful to grow up in a home and a community where other faiths are celebrated. And I will defend your ability to worship and to live your faith. And I appreciate those that offer that same respect to me. Absolutely. And I think, and I, I, gosh, you said so many things in there that I think are awesome. Like if I was in a classroom, I'm thinking if I, if I had someone say that, I'd be like, okay, everyone pause. Let's start dissecting that testimony of faith in the role of government in in faith and in religion. And I love how you said celebrate faith. And I think that is that would be a principle that um, President, President Oaks taught. We need to celebrate faith because it's really hard to, to, all, to have faith in these days. Like there are days where it's like, uh, like yeah. do I really need to have faith? Do, is my faith even gonna do anything? Is so it even my helping? Muslim friends and my Jewish friends, when we traveled in the Middle East, I mm-hmm. came back more committed to my faith because of the Muslims that I watched 
committed mm-hmm. to their faith. Like it didn't take away from mine. It added to mine to see others live their faith. Well, and to that point, uh, I'll, we'll go back to last week real quick. And I'll just say one thing about polygamy. Okay. And that is, we didn't talk about no, we didn't. It. We'll talk about it more in this episode, but all I wanted to say is one thing, um, going back and reading, especially the accounts of the women, because I have a hard time wrapping my mind around polygamy, mm-hmm. like most people do. And I'm, I, I don't have the personal experience to put myself in what might it be like to be a woman in those. And so, I, and so I go through and I read them. And one of the things that I respect um, that always leaps out to me is their faith. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and my, my great, or my grandma, my grandma Sorensen, she's the one person I know that's somewhat connected to a plural marriage. So she comes from a guy by the name of Samuel Ross Kelly. Those, those in Logan will know him. Mm-hmm. He was the first recorder of the Logan temple. Oh. And he was a really interesting guy. And he was a, he, um, had seven wives and over 30 children, kind of that narrative. And my grandma comes through his one of his sons, or comes through his family. And so um, she's a great grandchild. Anyway, my grandma, I will tell if anything marks my grandma, it's her faith. My grandma, it just has faith. She always had faith. You could warm your hands. I've used this phrase before. You could warm the hand, your hands by the fire of my grandma's faith. Wow. And um, there's and and although I don't understand it, that faith just leaps off the pages. Even when those um, some of those marriages ended up in divorce and and other things, there's still so much faith in that complexity. And so I appreciate you saying that. So just a shout out to all faith. Shout out to all <laughs> faith, right? Yeah. So speaking of President Oaks, if you okay. ever want to talk about religion and government, he's your guy, right? Yeah. So he even says in this last conference, uh, he or not the last in April, sorry, April of 2021, um, he ta- he gave a talk called "Defending Our Divinely Inspired Constitution." And really, what what we're trying to talk about here, and in section 134, is government, religion, <laughs> and then individual faith, and then they just crash into each other. Yeah. And it's a mess. And so these are trying to give guiding principles that will help. And he gives five in his talk that are really good. But let me just read a couple of things. He says, I speak from experience, from my experience as a law clerk to the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Okay. We'll believe you. He's not done, though. That's just his first sentence. (laughs) I speak from my 15 years as a professor of law and my three and a half years as a justice on the Utah Supreme Court. Okay. But then he says this, and I love it, but he says, but most important, I speak from 37 years as an apostle of Jesus Christ, responsible to study the meaning of the divinely inspired United States Constitution to the work of his restored church. So now he's been in this realm, and now as an apostle, he says, most importantly, is studying constitution in relation to gathering. And so that really stuck out to me, because then it led me to the question as of, what is the role of government in the gathering of Israel? And you and I have talked about there have been, there's been a lot of friction with that opening countries. And then when we do have a country where we can go in and gather, um, trying to build temples, mm-hmm. and then that can get into a whole thing. And, and so the role of government in the gathering of Israel is a big deal. It is. And so the fact there's a section in the Doctrine and Covenants really speaks to that. Um, so can I keep reading? Yeah, go. <laughs> I, I yeah I think I think what you're saying is so crucial and I asked you to do a Venn, Venn diagram for this section but you Dude, said no it was a mess yeah it would be I'm a mess. just saying that if Scott could make sense of it he could put it in a diagram and then we could post it and yeah. then you would go oh he yeah. made sense or of you'd the be mess. like what is he talking about <laughs> yeah there's that too I gave you full opportunity yeah it's all right okay I'm not going to okay hard pass <laughs> uh, but he he continues on and he says this there are many political issues and no party. No party, platform, or individual candidate can satisfy all personal preference. When he started saying that, I think all of us were like, wait, what's he saying? Mm -hmm. Because then he goes on and he says, um, each citizen must therefore decide which issues are most important to him or her at any particular time. Then members should seek inspiration on how to exercise their influence according to their individual priorities. This process will not be easy, understatement. It may require changing party support or candidate choices, even from election to election. Mm -hmm. And then he finishes by saying such independent actions will sometimes require voters to support candidates or political parties or platforms whose other positions they cannot approve. That is one reason we encourage our members to refrain from judging one another (laughs) in political matters. We should never assert or assert 
that a faithful Latter-day Saint cannot belong to a particular party or vote for a particular candidate. Okay, so the Spirit is saying to say this, but please do not send me hate. <laughs> oh, I'm distancing I, myself from you already. <laughs> Just to me, not to Scott. I would say that after this talk, I remember people using it as their political weapon to shoot at the other side. Yeah. And it made me very sad mm -hmm. because I think what he clearly states and what you just reshared with all of us is it is a personal assessment and decision. And if you're already deciding that anything you're hearing from the pulpit is for the person behind you, yeah. <laughs> you're probably missing the mm -hmm. whole point that we're in a one room schoolhouse being taught twice a year from general conference pulpits. And that that was an invitation for us to take serious our vote wherever you live in the world. And I love that you reference, you know, my son served in Zimbabwe and there was a temple before he went. Now he's been home two years. So we're close to five years where it has not been easy to get that temple built. And it was mainly because of political interference. And I don't want to delay the process. So that's all I'm going to say about <laughs> it for all of our Zimbabwe uh, mm -hmm. fans that are watching. So I, I, I just would say for me, as you were just speaking to that, Elder Anderson in that same conference talked about Zion will be built by many faiths. Mm -hmm. It will not just be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So yep. is government supporting the exercise of faith and religion because we're going to need everyone to build Zion? Absolutely. And, and that's kind of where, and that was the perspective shift for me with this section with uh, President Oaks is, is I've never really, I, I, I've thought about all the political issues and where I can align. I've never really thought of it in context of the gathering of Israel. Yeah, and that's our invitation. As a priority. So. And that's our invitation, right? That we, this week, uh, in, in the United States in November, there are election time, but we know that this is a global audience, so maybe it hasn't just been an election for you in your area. But what are the ways in which you can use your political voice to, in a civil way, yes. right? In a civil way, help um, via the laws of the land gather Israel. And I think the first thing we could do is stop weaponizing mm -hmm. <laughs> one another, making everyone an it. Yeah. Uh, because that that is not helping build Zion and, and gather Israel. So that's our invitation this week, and we'll see you again next week on Real Talk. Come follow me. You guys, you guys, please like and subscribe and click the bell. Like and subscribe. What did I say? You did it. it like perfect. and subscribe. That was so perfect. And click the bell. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>